my interest really was on kind of the politics and the aesthetics of nationalism and separatism um, and how, how maybe we react in our artwork to different kind of cultural formations and identities, um, but also how we kind of think about pragmatism in the current moment uh, and how we respond to the loss of land, the loss of language maybe, to colonial practices and so on, but always in an indigenous context. I was never really working in an, in, in an Irish studies way. I was never really that given to, to examining Irish literature to a degree. Um, but I wrote to Leal at one point, I was working on a novel called Shell Shaker, which I, I recommend to everybody. Um, and Shell Shaker is, is Leanne's first text and it's, it's just mind blowing. It's um, a work in which we can begin to see all these kind of imbrications of so much of what Cass has been saying at the beginning, imbrications of family, of ancestry, of thinking in kind of in circular terms, thinking in global terms, in what it means to be transnational and transglobal. Um, there's a fantastic character in it who is working with the IRA called James Joyce, for instance. Uh, and, you know, he's there alongside her Choctaw ancestors. She writes about the mound, uh, Nanawea. She writes about the spiritual um, homelands of the Choctaw. And she writes about removal uh, and the long Choctaw history. So at that point, I read the novel. It, as far as I was concerned, I was working on the aesthetics the sovereignty of separatism. I was thinking about all of these kind of questions. So I contacted Leanne and she very generously came back straight away. And quite often you find that, that even the, the kind of most famous Native American writers and artists are so happy to talk about and chat about their work. Uh, so Leanne and I became friends and for quite a few years, we never spoke about the Choctaw Irish gift. It just, it literally never came up because we both knew about it. And, and I think in some ways we didn't feel a need to gloss it. We didn't feel a need to delve into it. You know, we were working on other things at the time. Um, but two or three years after we met, Leanne said to me uh, over a cup of coffee, she'd been in, in Goldsmiths twice. She came to London to do two guest lectures. And she looked at me um, <laughs> midway through a conversation and said, so when are we going to do it? And I said, do what, Leanne? And she said, when are we going to write about the Choctaw and the Irish? Because, you know... <laughs> We're there now, you know, we've worked together long enough to, I think for both of us, I mean, for me, I have a squeamishness about maybe thinking about a kind of a dangerous narrative of equivalence. I'm a middle-aged white guy who has a very privileged academic kind of setting that I work within. Um, and Imelda May's poem, which Cathy told me about from Friday evening, um, has kind of, you know, that's been bubbling in my mind over the weekend, but also the kind of the connotations, that kind of sense that because we're Irish, we somehow have this easy access to a sense of alterity uh, or to difference. Uh, and we know what it means to, to have suffered traumas. We do, but the question is how do we access that narrative and how do we do it in a way that maybe, you know, does no harm to those who are at different points in that journey. In 1847, Leanne's tribe, the Choctaw, sent we were disputed about it might have been $172, it could have been $710, or it could have been $170. In any event, the money, the, the dollar amount is not what's important, but they, they gathered this money together in a place called Scullyville uh, in Oklahoma, and they sent the money from there to Ireland via New York, via some of the um, relief funds that have been established in during the, the, the Great Famine in Ireland. So it was a huge act of munificence. I mean, Leanne will talk much more about, about where the Choctaw were on their journey at that point, but this was just after the Trail of Tears, of course. Um, and there are many reasons, obviously, I think, why they, they sent the money, but the money would have been given um, through to Dublin. Very possibly, we know from our work with a, a great friend of ours and collaborator, Christine Keneally, that money would possibly have gone through to the Quakers, who then would have used it in soup kitchens uh, across the nation in Ireland, so it would have fed the very poorest uh, at the time. And the, the money was just given. It was uh, a great act of charity, great act of benevolence from one nation to another. So I'll let Leanne come in there. Anama Jakta Sia Hoke, Sa Leanne Hal. That's a, uh, I just said that I'm, I'm Choctaw and given my name. It's a very simple introduction. And um, if you come to Durant, sometimes our introductions. Uh, are rarely about ourselves, but about our journeys and um, 
Uh, the tribal headquarters today uh, are located in Durant, Oklahoma. It's about two hours south of where my ancestral home is in, um, and actually it's in the Chickasaw Nation. And how we got there is a really interesting story um, for another time. But, um, and I wanted to say all of these movements are a consequence of uh, colonialism, having people move, the movement that we've lived through. And you can see, um, uh, I think, the civil unrest that's erupted in the United States today is based on some of these arbitrary movements and um, uh, bringing people, slaves, into the territories um, uh, as far back as 1736 and into the Choctaw Nation. And um, I, I think now in 2020, that's why we're seeing all these kinds of eruptions that are happening. They're linked to our histories. So to abate um, hunger, to abate um, suffering across the across the oceans. I think the Choctaws believed then as they believe now that one of the ways to mitigate and intervene in terrible upheavals and times of crisis are to give food, give money for food. And this is exactly what they did at Scullyville. Someone brought the news. And you have to think about that. Someone brought the news about the, uh, the terrible famine that was happening in Ireland. So uh, at Scullyville, we had these meetings. Some were based around um, uh, the times that the federal government would pay their annuity to us for our land, which rarely happened. Uh, but at these meetings at Scullyville, that, that was the reason that they had come together was to be able to trade, right? To trade money. So when they heard the news, um, and this is very poignant to me, when they heard the news, they immediately said, well, we have to do something. We have to intervene as people. And um, they took up a collection and sent it. And so I just wanted to bring that full circle because I, I did not know um, this history until my mother told me. And I was a grown person and she was just kind of offhand about it. Oh, you know, we did this and did this. And I was so surprised. And I thought, why, why and how um, did we make that leap of faith that we could collect money and then it would arrive there? And she said, because people would do that. And I, I am so honored by this extraordinary event that my family and my tribe are intimately linked to uh, the people of Ireland. It makes me so proud of this relationship that, that is, is ongoing and continuing until this day. And I'm so, so proud of um, the Irish community sending aid into the Navajo Nation is, a, is to me another expression. I think Pork probably talked about this and please jump in at any time. Um, I am um, heartened by the way that our communities uh, and the Irish and the Choctaw and the other, other uh, indigenous People around the world have responded to these pandemics. It really gives, it really makes me feel um, uh, not as scared as I would. <laughs> I think it's one of the most affirming stories we've heard during the pandemic in some ways. And I mean, the international celebration of it has been, you know, well, as far as I'm concerned, as an academic, unprecedented, you know, I've had calls from Time Magazine, you know, CBS News have been on about this. And I think, 
as Leanne is saying, it's, it's just a story of hope um, at this particular moment. And I think, I think for, for us, I mean, people have said to me since this happened, like I mean, nearly a million and a half of the $5 million that the Navajo Fund has received has been from Ireland. Uh, and people have, the day I went to, someone said to me, Brian Tomperty spoke about it on, on Irish radio. And the day I went to look, all of the names were Irish and they were writing Osquelga. They were saying, you know, the heart remembers and, uh, you know, we want to pay back and so on. Um, and people were saying to me, why do you think that happened in Ireland? And I said, well, it is a small country. OK, let's be, let's be honest, first and foremost, that word spreads quickly. Um, but I'm not being, you know, I'm not being glib in that. I think there's also the fact that we are, you know, in some ways, and you're saying this at the beginning, Kat, there's this kind of element of us being local. We know each other. Our communities function in a certain way. We talk to each other. Um, and that that's an important part of it. And I think... To go back to the original gift, I mean, yes, the money comes, and, and as Leanne has very often said, and I'm, I'm really grateful for this intervention, that the money was sent, and that was it. It was something that Choctaw did. It wasn't a big thing. It was like, we're sending money. You need money, we're sending it, and it's done. Um, and it wasn't that it was, you know, given in a way that it was about kind of a, a gift culture where you get something back or anything like that. It was just sent. Um and I think for, for the idea of survivance, you know, Native critics have spoken about the idea of how you survive and overcome trauma. I think from the Choctaw in 1847, there was a sense of we have survived, we have been removed, we've lost our lands, but we're still here. Um, and there was an important act of recognition, I think, as well. I think it was about saying we as a nation of people who are still existing are sending money to you as a nation of people who have also suffered um, for various reasons you're suffering right now. And I think that's a really important part of it. And there's also a great sense of pragmatism. And I love that about the, the, the Navajo Hopi tribes. I've had a, an email from, from Ethel Branch, who is the Attorney General of Navajo Nation in the last few days, just to, to recognize, you know, and this idea of reaching out and saying, you know, we need it now. And, and because of the social inequalities, because of the, the legacy of all those um, institutionalized forms of racism that Leanne is talking about and because of deprivation and loss of land and so on we need the money and, and, and we so appreciate it so when I think of storytellers and we have some in, in some Choctaw and Irish storytellers in, in the book I think of how story functions in both cultures I think that's really important I think how we, yeah. we share these stories that's a huge part of our survivance and I think there's also as I say a, a great sense of, of the material of how the world functions. Mary Robinson once said that Ireland is a first world country with a third world memory. Um, I think she was working. Mm. I think Luke Gibbons maybe had said that originally in, in, one, in one part before she used the first speech. And I think that's very true. I think there's this kind of idea of us sharing and, and recognizing politically various forms of sovereignty, culturally, spiritually. I think there's, there's so much there. I mean, you were talking about New Grange earlier on Leanne and I have been thinking about how the mounds in Choctaw culture and how Celtic, pre-Celtic tradition and Celtic tradition, yeah. you know, all these connections are there. And I like that idea of, of someone bringing the story. I reckon that in Scullyville, in Oklahoma, in the 1840s, there were people who were sharing stories that were sophisticatedly laying out all of these points of connection. And the gift speaks to all of those. They're, they're perhaps they're silent within the gift, but they're in, they're, they're in there. And, and it's a very powerful silence in a way. I think they're carried by the $172 or the $710. The day before yesterday, I think it was in Denver, Colorado, and natives had come together to support the, the, um, the, the people who were chanting in Black Lives Matter. And what uh, a woman and the a drum had done was that they, they drank, they uh, did a dance, which was a um, uh, a way of giving song and giving voice. And the cameras had filmed that. It was in a huge gathering around these Native people who were singing. And um, so uh, the, the idea of song and song chant continues uh, both in in Choctaw culture, but in the, the tribes out west, uh, they were probably Cheyenne, Arapaho, they didn't didn't mention the tribes, but 
the singing and the chanting and trying to lift the voices and give the spirit a voice and mind to those protesters who so badly need it. It's not just food. It's not just food. It is the ability to pass on the, the power of our breath and mind. And that's, that's what uh, I also recognize that in storytelling with the Irish. I recognize this power of breath and mind that goes on in our, um, our ways of being together. And I, I saw that at Strokestown, uh, so powerfully exhibited in the people that came together because they were walking, they were about to take, take the walk of the ancestors. Isa halaliha toko, Iksa ilya ishashki. Isa halaliha toko, Iksa ilya ishashki. Because you are holding on to me, I am not dead yet. I am not dead yet. There you go. There's a song. You can sing it. You can be part of that. I am not dead yet because we are holding on to each other across the oceans, across generations, across time, and into the future. That's what that means. <laughs>